All right. Okay, if there's no other questions, we're going to go ahead and transition to our Bible study. We're in Titus chapter 1. And our focus is Paul's salutation to Titus. And this is one, one through four. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give you a thanks this evening for the blessing of being able to come in a, in a country where we can come freely and participate without being persecuted. We thank you that we can gather to study your word, to be encouraged, and to be an encouragement to others. We pray that as we open up Holy Scripture, that you would bless this time, make it profitable for your kingdom, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're at Roman numeral number one. And of course, this is Paul's salutation to Titus. Chapter one, verses one through four. Last week, we looked at his introduction in his salutation, which is Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle. And this is going to be the focus in the first three verses we see here. It says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness in the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. So here, the first thing he talks about, of course, is himself, as he does in all of his epistles, introducing himself. The first thing that Paul did in his introduction of himself was Paul reminded Titus And what did he remind him of? He reminded him of both his status and his office. And this is chapter 1a, uh, chapter 1, verse 1a. Now, last week, we got as far as Paul's self-disclosure of himself. Paul's self-disclosure. And, and what did Paul view himself as? He was a slave. Yes, he was a slave. We, we, we kept with what our version said and said bond slave, but really it means slave. Let's pick it up there. Not only do we have a self-disclosure by Paul of, of how he viewed himself, his, his own status, and really, is that just true of Paul? What did we see last week? What did we see, what did we see last week? Is, 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 is being a bond slave, being a slave, only, only true of the Apostle Paul? No. All of us, in fact, Peter calls all Christians slaves. He uses the same word, and he refers to all believers in that way. And so what we saw was it's not just Paul and the apostles who view themselves as slaves. When they talk about other Christians, they refer to them as slaves too. And so this is a, this is a general way in which Christians are both viewed and how they communicate who they are. This is, this is our self-disclosure of ourselves to others. But Paul's not finished yet. He then turns to his official capacity. His official capacity. And what was his official capacity? He was what? He was an apostle, yes. He was an apostle. Now, 
Now, how many have heard the term apostle applied to somebody living today? Anybody? Has anybody heard that? Okay, so we had a, a lot of people in our church apparently uh, have, have been in some strange circumstances because a lot of you have heard about people today being referred to as apostles. Uh, I, went to, I went to support somebody in ministry, this is many years ago, and um, it was downtown and they were being installed in the church. And I got there uh, and uh, much to my chagrin, uh, on the stage with me was an apostle. Uh, I didn't know they were still living. And uh, he looked good, I mean, for being 2,000 years old, but <laughs> he looked very good. I don't know if he was 2,000 years old, actually, but uh, he definitely referred to himself as an apostle, and everybody else referred to him as an apostle. And so... So that's different. Uh, church of the Apostles is meaning a church that, that is in, in line with the apostolic witness. That's different than what we're talking about. We're talking about people who refer to themselves as apostles. So <clears throat> in our religious context, we reject the modern application of this term to anyone living today. But let's be honest. Our position is not the only position that is advocated in the Christian world, all right? And so it's been, it's been, it's been quite some time since we've done an in-depth study of apostle, and I thought, what better time here at the beginning of Titus uh, when Paul goes on this elongated discussion of his, his office, he, he doesn't do this very often, let's take some time and look at apostle and then decide whether people today ought to be using this term to describe themselves. Is this a good term for people who are in <laughs> ministry to use for themselves? Hopefully by the end of our study of this important New Testament concept, we'll know whether those people are accurate or not. So let's begin. Uh, this is kind of going to be a parenthetical thought, I guess, if you want to do the outline. But um, let's begin with the vocabulary. the vocabulary behind the office, the vocabulary behind the office. Now, the word apostle and its significance for the church is found, you might find this interesting, not in the meaning of the word itself. It's not, the, it's not in the word's meaning that we draw significance. It's in the word's usage that we find significance. Here, usage is definitely more important than meaning. But meaning is important. So let's, what does the word mean? Um, the, the meaning of the, of the word apostle basically means sent one. sent one. Now, in its, in its cultural usage, meaning how the, how the Greeks use this idea, in the cultural usage, the individual sending often chose this person to fulfill a particular task and conveyed upon them certain powers or authority that enabled them to carry out that task. So, an apostle in the Greek culture was a, a sent person, and that sent person had a task to follow out. So they were, they were sent to accomplish a task, and to accomplish that task, they needed something. What they needed to accomplish that task was authority. If somebody is going to send you to do something, you need authority to carry that something out. Therefore, in a real sense, this word could refer to an authoritative sent one. If you wanted to really 
stretch it out, <clears throat> an authoritative sent one. That's the vocabulary, very simple word, sent one, oftentimes, most of the time, with, with authority, and they were sent to do a task. Well, how is this term used in the Bible? Well, let's look at the early application of this term. The early application of this term. You would expect that you're going to find this term used earliest in where? In the Bible. Excuse me? Acts, okay. Is that, is, is that where you expect the earliest uses of it? Uh, I'm going to say the Gospels. I'm going to say the Gospels. Because this word we now, uh, of course, when you say that, the, the Gospels, the dating of them uh, is a little bit later. But looking at the Bible as a canon, an authoritative body of teaching, the first place it's used is in the Gospels. So you're kind of right and wrong at the same time. So it's in the Gospels that we find its early uses in the authoritative canon of Scripture. Each of the Gospels use this term, okay? So all the Gospels use it. And they use it, interestingly, exclusively to refer to the group that came to be known as the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. So whenever this word apostle is used in, in the Gospels, it refers to the 12. Now, its first occurrence in both Matthew and Luke appeared in Jesus' choosing of these 12 men. That's where, that's where we see it first. Uh, let's, let's turn particularly to Luke chapter, chapter 6. We'll, we'll look at it in Luke rather than Matthew. Luke chapter 6. Here we have the first, now, now Luke uses this more than any other of the Gospels. This word is hardly ever used in the Gospels. Okay, it's hardly ever used. When it is used, Luke uses it more than anybody else, but he doesn't use it that much. Just, just an FYI for you. So in Luke 6, verse 12 and 13, we have the following. And it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. Now, this is followed in our text by the naming of the 12 men normally referred to as the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, what do you learn about these 12 men from this from this passage. What do you see here? They were chosen, okay. That's a good, that's a good observation. So uh, from, uh, from Luke 6, we see that these men were chosen. What else do we see? Anything? Part of a bigger group. Anything else to see about these 12 men? What did Jesus call them? What did he call these 12 men? Apostles. He called them apostles, right? So these 12, these 12 disciples, Jesus himself called apostles, right? So I wanna, all these are good. Right now I wanna focus on, on these two. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is that the 12 were not the only followers of Jesus Christ. Okay, now this is important. They were not the only followers. But they were selected out of a broader group of individuals who had answered Jesus' call to follow him. So there was, there was a large group of people following Jesus, and from that larger group, Jesus chooses 12. This should be noted in, in, in the context of at least another group 
of disciples. Do you, do you remember in the Gospels there being another group of disciples? Excuse me? John had disciples, yes. So did they have some that, that turned away? Yes, but I'm looking for another specific group. 70. So, so the, 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 the Bible identifies this group of 70 disciples that are distinguished from the 12. So, so, the, so the 70 are not equal to the 12. Different groups. So the, the 12 is not a part of the 70. And nobody in the 70 is part of the 12. Okay? Uh, you can write down a couple of passages that are important here. Luke uh, 10, 1 through 20, and Luke 9, 1 through 6. Why do I want you to recognize these two, these two texts? Well, Jesus both appointed and sent out the group of 70 into Judea and the surrounding regions while the 12 happened to be ministering elsewhere in Galilee. So while the 12 are in Galilee, the 70 are commissioned by Christ and sent out. All right, so this, clearly these are not two of the same groups here. These are different groups of, of disciples. Yes, uh, Luke 10, 1 through 20, and 9, 1 through 6. A similar broader group of closer followers of Jesus was mentioned in John 6. And this is where what Azure said comes into play. There was, there was a group of disciples that were different than the 12 who abandoned Jesus. I'll turn to John chapter 6. <clears throat> John chapter 6. Now, we have no idea in this text as to what the number was. We don't know what the, we don't know what the number was. But we clearly see a differentiation between this group and the 12. Right? I'm going to reading in verse 66 of John 6. As a result of this, many of, the, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Jesus said, therefore, to the twelve, see that? You do not want to go with them also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you? That's what, that's what, what Don said earlier. Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil. So, we can establish, by starting with this passage in the New Testament, we can establish the, the, the fact that these 12 men were a special group separated out of the broader group of Jesus' intimate disciples who had responded to his call. So there was a group that had responded to his call, a large group of, of, of people. Of that larger group of people, Jesus chose 12 while the broader group also ministered on Jesus' behalf, as did the, uh, the uh, 12, none of them are ever considered as being part of the 12. The, the 12 are a set group. They, he, he names them, and the group never grows bigger, at least in the Gospels. It does shrink by one, but it never grows bigger in the Gospels. There's nobody that's designated, in addition to these 12, that are considered to be part of the 12. All right? I'm sorry? Uh, that's, that's the book of Acts, not the Gospels. Okay. Go ahead. Um, is there any correlation between the ones that abandoned being part of the original 70? I'd have to look at the, the dates associated with that, but I, I believe the dates are probably different. So, so the 70 are co commissioned and sent out after this. But I'd have to look at that to make sure. Yeah. All right, so that's the, uh, the uh, first point. They're part of a bigger group, just as uh, I think Sister Pam gave us that observation. But I wanted to draw attention also to the fact that they were called apostles. They were called apostles. We can see here in Luke's recording of the separation of the twelve from the others that Jesus tagged these individuals with a special designation, apostles. 
a designation that was never used to describe any other of Jesus' followers who ministered on his behalf. So others ministered on his behalf. They never received the designation apostles. Luke is the only gospel writer that we can say used this word extensively, and each time he used it, it referred only to these 12 men. All right. However, although the term is not often used in the gospels, the special nature of these 12 men becomes obvious as you survey the gospels references to them. So it, it's not used very often, but if you, if you look at it's how it's used, it becomes clear these men are, are special. They're set aside, they're cut out, and they're very unusual. What this tells us is that the designation, the apostles, referred to a special group of men about whom special attributions were made by Christ. I want to look at those attributions this evening. Well, I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, but... I want to look at the, the special attributions. Made in the Gospels. Well, we, 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 we may be able to get to them all this evening. The first one is Matthew 17. Sorry, Matthew 13, not 17, Matthew 13. Now, Throughout the gospel record, Jesus is recorded answering questions asked by the 12 in context where he had been instructing a large group of his followers. So Jesus, in the gospels, is teaching this large group, and then sometimes there's a little aside, a side conversation. And the side conversation is just with these 12. One of the most well-known is, is found here in Matthew chapter 13, where we have Jesus starting to use his teaching methodology of parables. The, the 12 immediately recognize the unusual nature of this, and they ask questions. They're not used to this teaching method that Christ instituted here, so they ask him about his method. Twice in Matthew 13, they're pictured, of asking, they're pictured as asking Jesus questions in private. And once he concluded his response with these words in Matthew 13, verse 17. What does he say here? For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Now, what is he saying in this text about these 12 men? Are they your average run-of-the-mill guys? Who does he compare them to in this text? Prophets, righteous men. So that means what? These men are significant, right? I mean, if the prophets and righteous men didn't get this, and they got it, this is designating them as being special, unusual. Okay? Clearly, a special status was attributed to them, even in distinction from the prophets and righteous men of old, let alone those who both followed him and ministered on his behalf. Matthew 13. Turn, yes, 13, the word apostle is not used. No, it's not. I'm focusing on these 12 men. I know. Who? These 12 men were called disciples. I'm just trying to see. At, so, disciple could also include apostles. So, the 12 apostles were called, sorry, the, the, the 12 disciples were called apostles. That was the official designation given to the 12. So, at some times, they're called the 12 disciples. Correct. Sometimes, apostles. Yes. But disciple and apostle is not interchangeable. Right. Right. Because every disciple is not an apostle. But the 12 disciples 
We're all apostles. We're all apostles, yes. So 12 disciples applies also to the, the 12 apostles. It's the same group. Okay, yeah. that, that's all I'm yeah. saying. Same group, yes. Thank you. Matthew 19. This is another interesting statement made by Jesus regarding these men. And this statement is made on the heels of the famous interaction between himself and the rich young ruler. You know that story well, right? This rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he wants to know how to inherit eternal life. What does Jesus tell him? Sell everything you got. Sell everything you got and come and follow me. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not writing these down for you, am I? So but the first one we did was Matthew 13, 17. And now we're doing Matthew 19. I'll give you the verse in a minute. So you, you, you're familiar with this, with this story. This, they come, how can I have eternal life? Jesus says, sell all you got, follow me. In other words, become my disciple. That's what he's saying. Become my disciple, and you'll have eternal life. Well, Peter is listening to this. After that happens, Jesus then turns to the to the disciples, and he talks to them about how to how about eternal life and the rich, and and and, and it's very difficult for the rich uh, to, to gain eternal life. It's easier for for what a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven. All right, and so Peter's listening to all this 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 dialogue back and forth uh, that Jesus that Jesus is having, and that leads Peter to ask a question. Verse 27, then Peter answered and said to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? Is that a legitimate question by Peter? Is that true? How, how do we know that? How do we, how do we know this is true? <laughs> they just left their nets and they followed him. I mean, they left everything. This is a, this is a, Remember, he's listening to what Jesus said. If you want to have eternal life, sell everything you got, come follow me. That's what he did. Just dropped it on the beach and, and walked. So Peter says, what's happening with us? All right. Jesus' response had an important attribution made regarding the, the, the apostles. Now, in verse 29 and 30, he applies it to, to, to all believers. But verse 28 he applies that specifically to the 12. Notice what he says. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Does that seem like a special designation to you? <laughs> and it's very particular. It's hard to make the 12 tribes of Israel equal the church. <laughs> okay, that, that, that doesn't make any sense. This, this statement, if, if, if you believe that Israel is the church, this statement just makes no sense. And then why the 12 thrones? As if there's 12 churches. It doesn't make no sense. This is, of course, a reference to national Israel. This is a reference to the Jews. And it's also a reference to Jesus having a, giving a special designation and a special function for the 12 in reference to the Jewish nation. They will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Here we see them being promised a special position in the kingdom in relationship to Israel. Clearly, these men were to have a special place in the program of God unique to only them. Not, thir not 13 tribes of Israel. They're not, they're not 14 tribes of Israel. 12. So whoever these apostles are, they're going to have sit on 12 thrones. Uh, you can write down also Luke 22, 24 through 30. Yes, go ahead, Sister Jan. So he said, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration. What does he mean by that? I mean, why does he feel it? Why does he say the regeneration? Since, he, since all believers are regenerated. 
Well, he's, he's talking about this, this particular age that they're in. Uh, this is the age of regeneration. Uh, uh, Christ, Christ is preaching the, the message of, of the gospel. People are repenting and entering the kingdom. When the kingdom comes, Christ indicates, he's going to sit on his throne, and they will be reigning and ruling with him, particularly over the 12 tribes. And so it, 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 it's just a way of, of describing the particular age that we're in now. James and John. His son could sit on the right hand of, of him. James and John. Well, he already said here yeah, that, you know, you're going to have a problem, you know. So, um, yeah, but, the, yeah, but in, in this picture, they're all equals. They're all equals. They wanted a special higher than everybody else. But, but they, they understood what Jesus was, they, I think they understood clearly what, what he was talking about. I mean, I mean in, 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 in Acts chapter 1, what's, what's the last question they ask him before he leaves? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Is this the time that the kingdom gets restored to Israel? We're waiting on it. Christ says, you, you know, there's not you know the times in the epochs. Don't worry about that. All right, you're going to be my, you're going to be, you're going to be my, my witnesses. Matthew 19, 28. These 12 men are also spoken of in John 17. Yes. I made a reference to Luke 22, 24 through 30. Thanks. Yeah, you can cross-reference that. Uh, possibly the most important pre-resurrection statement of their uniqueness, however, is found in the message often referred to as the Upper Room Discourse. Now, throughout this discourse, Various designations were, were made that clearly separated these men from any of the other followers of Jesus, both at that moment or in the future. The prelude to the message of the Upper Room Discourse, John 13, referred in verse 1, they are referred to as his own. John 13, 1, they're referred to as his own. And John 13 I, I, I identified his love for his own. Jesus referred to, to these men as chosen in distinction from Judas. In chapter 13, verse 18, chapter 15, verses 16 through 17, and verse 19. So they're referred to chosen in distinction from Judas. And so the number gets reduced from 12 to what? 11, yeah. Coinciding with this choosing was a special appointing they also received. That's chapter 13, verse 16. But the most explicit statement about their unique character is found in Jesus' communication out of the Father in John 17. That's where we're going to spend our time, John 17. This is sometimes we, we, we refer to as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Now, although we know this, this prayer to include Jesus' concern to be glorified, that's how, the, that's how it begins. Christ wants to be glorified with the glory he had, he had with, the, with, with the Father, verses 1 through 5. Just as important to Jesus was the apostles and their ongoing ministry their ongoing conduct in the world after he went. So Jesus is definitely concerned with his glory in this passage, but he's also concerned, I mean, when you read John 17, it's got the apostles all over it. He's concerned, he's concerned with, with those 12 men, now 11. Look at verse 6, for example. <clears throat> John 17. I manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Here we definitely have a reference to just the apostles, and we see their uniqueness to both Jesus and the Father in comparison with the rest of his followers. 
Let me, read, let me read, read that again. I manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Jesus indicated that he revealed himself to these men. Also, they belonged to God, speaking of his election of them. They were, they were the fathers before they were Jesus's. And the Father gives them to Jesus. That, that's what that verse is saying. He chose them out of the mass of humanity. He chose them out of all of his followers to be his disciples, to be his apostles. As a consequence of them truly being gods, unlike Judas, they kept thy word, Jesus said in that verse. They kept his word. Gee, Judas didn't do that, did he? No. Continuing on, look at the next statement, verse 7 and 8. Now they have come to know that everything thou hast given me is from thee. For, thy, for the words which thou gavest me I have given to them. And they received them, and they truly understand that I, am, uh, that I came forth from thee, and they believed that thou didst send me. These 12 men, through the earthly ministry of Jesus, became convinced of Jesus' unique relationship with the Father, which was recorded, of course, in Matthew 16 and John 6, two texts we looked at earlier, which, which of course, distinguished the apostles from the rest of Jesus' followers. These men were, were convinced of Jesus' unique relationship, these, these men particularly. Possibly the most important aspect of their uniqueness, given their designation as apostles, was the fact that Jesus prayed in particular for a mission he had for them. This is, this is where the, you, you say, well, the word apostle doesn't appear in John 17, Pastor. I know that. But mission appears here. Mission appears here. This is, this is important. Jesus indicates in John 17 that these men were specifically going to be sent. And of course, that's where we get the title apostle. This mission sets them apart from other believers of all time. Jesus intended for these men to be the conduit or mechanism through which he would bring about the existence of the community of his followers, which would eventually be called the church. So these men in this text are identified as what we would say later as the foundation of the church. They're gonna, they're gonna bring the church into existence and Jesus is going to send them to do that task, all right? Throughout this prayer, Jesus has been voicing a concern for these men to be kept safe in the world. That's verse 11. Jesus wants them safe. Why does he want them safe? He wants them safe because the world hates them, but why else? Verse 15, does he want them safe? Any other reason why he wants them safe? Is it just the world that's the problem? The evil one. The devil is the problem. He's also a problem. The world and the devil want these men. Now, at first you might say, well, that's not unique. The devil wants us too. The world hates us. Well, yeah, that's not unique. But, 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 but watch this. After asking that the Father sanctify them in the truth, verse 17, Jesus made this statement. Look at verse 18. As thou descend me into the world, I also have what? Sent them. What does the apostle mean? Sent one. Sent one. One sent. What would this mission entail? Why was he sending them? Well, after speaking of the issue of them being sanctified in the, in the truth again, Jesus highlighted what would be the scope of their mission. Look at verse 20. I do not ask in behalf of these alone, but for those also who, who will believe in me through their word. So why are they being sent? What are they being sent to accomplish? According to verse 20. What are they being sent for? The church to, to, to bring people to believe, right? That's, that's, that's their task. That's why they're being sent. This is obviously a reference uh, out of the church, and it situates 
the apostles as the necessary means to the formation. Jesus is saying, I'm praying not only for them, but specifically for all those who will believe through them. So are they the same as those who are going to believe? No, they're not. Not according to this verse. Everybody else is going to believe is, is lumped into one category, and they're going to believe through them. Now, just so you know, I'm not making this stuff up. I'll keep your finger here. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 2. What does Hebrews 2 say? Well, look at how the author of Hebrews paints the same picture that Jesus just painted. Hebrews 2, I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also bring witness with them, both by signs and wonders, and by various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Do you see the three groups of people here? You have Jesus, right? And he gives it to who? We're not told who, but we're, they're, they're described, right? How does he describe them? Yeah, these are a special group of people that had signs and wonders attached to them. Who, who's that obviously speaking about? That's obviously the apostles, right? Without a question. And then what happens after them? We believe. We believe. And notice here something with me. This text indicates that it's not that, that, that he was bearing witness through them, but really he's bearing witness with them. In other words, part of their mission was to bear witness. Bear witness. John 17 clearly indicates this is a special group of followers. It, it's interesting as you bring out the uniqueness of our specialist group of uh, disciples are, and where I know there are some churches, primarily I've, I've seen them in the they, they call them apostolic churches, and they, they believe that they have these same abilities mm -hmm. as the apostles, yeah. which, which puts them head and shoulder above the everybody world. else. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so they understand the uniqueness of the apostles, how special they were. And they want to identify with them. And, and this is why it's important for us to understand what we teach. Why, why, is, it, why is it that we don't adopt this this particular viewpoint. What, what is it about the scriptures that lead us not to make the same conclusion that they make? Yes. And, 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 and that's his calling card. And, 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 and. Uh, you know, he could do signs and wonders too. Yeah. Had, the same signs and wonders that the, the apostles did. He had the same authority that God had given him. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and we're going to get to that, not, probably not this week, but we're going to get to that probably next time. Let's, let's look at the final gospel passage I want to turn to, because this concept of bearing witness clues us to a, a really critical text. And that critical text is Luke 24. Why, why, why am I turning here? Well, the word bearing witness is a verb. And that verb is only used in the Bible in Hebrews chapter, chapter 2. However, the, 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 the verb bearing witness is the verb has a noun attached to, to, to it as in the family of, of in, in the family of terms and that's the that's the, the noun witness so bearing witness 
That's how he identified these men in Hebrews. Hebrews 2, which you which just read, the word bearing witness is a verb. The noun form of this idea, witness, is used all over the New Testament except the Gospels. There's one passage in the Gospel that uses the word witness. And why am I belaboring that? Well, again, this is how the disciples are described. The, the, the apostles are described as bearing witness. That's what they did. They, that's what the author Hebrews said. They're, they're, they're bearing witness type people. So the verb is only used there, but the noun is used all over the Bible in reference to the apostles. So we know that witness, witness is a good way of describing the, the apostles. It's only used one place in, in, in the Gospels, Luke chapter 24. Now, in Luke, in Luke chapter 24, We have this statement. Verse 48. You are witnesses of these things. That's the only way, there's the only place this is used. Now, who's he talking? Who's the you here? The disciples minus who? Judas. So, okay, so, so this, is, this is the 11. What are the, these things that the witnesses to? These things. You are witnesses of these things. Well, let, let's, let's, let's try to break it down. Let's, let, let's go through the text and see if we can identify what these things are. According to verse 44, they were things about Jesus that had been spoken before. Look at verse 44. And he said to them, These are my words as I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things that are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So these things were about Jesus. And these things had been spoken beforehand. Where? In the Bible. The law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And these things had been what? What, what, what was the overriding definition of these things as far as uh, this verse is concerned? They were what? Fulfilled, right? Go ahead. Okay. They were fulfilled. This was the reason that Jesus opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. Look at the flow here. Verse four. After Christ said these things have been fulfilled where? In law of Moses, the prophets, and Psalms. What did he do? Verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Why would he have to do that? Do you hear them? They had to understand the connection between what was said before in the scriptures. That's verse 44. Jesus said that's where they they are. They're fulfilled. So in other words, they're fulfilled where? In my life. So they needed to see where the the spoken word fulfilled in the actions and life of Jesus. They needed to be able to make the connections. All right? With their minds being opened they would be able to make the biblical connections with what they saw of him, which was clearly Jesus' intent when he followed the opening of their minds with this statement. Look at verse 46 through 47. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. What this means then is that these things to which Jesus was re- referring in verse 48, which they're witnesses of, 
where his fulfilling of the biblical claims regarding the Messiah, the Messiah's rejection, and the Messiah's resurrection. They needed to see the link between what was spoken beforehand and his life, his death, and his resurrection. Now, let me just say something. On, this is a side note. I hope it doesn't confuse you. But one of the things that people, people read Luke 24, and this is the second time we, we see a reference to the Old Testament, and people kind of think, so they say, okay, so the, the Old Testament talks about Jesus. What they assume is this. It talks about his death or his resurrection. And they try to find that everywhere. It also talks about his life. So just because you don't see the death or resurrection of Christ in the Old Testament passage doesn't mean the Old, pas Old Testament passage doesn't talk about Jesus. They limit it too much to the cross event and don't look at the whole scope of his life as a, as a Jew living in the world. So really every part of the Old Testament can say something about Jesus. Why? Because he was a Jew born under the law. He lived under the law, and he, and, and, he, and he lived it perfectly, and he died a perfect death. So a lot, is, so there's a, a bunch of his life is in the Old Testament. All of his life is in the Old Testament. Why? Because he lived under the law as a Jew. All right? So that's, that's, a, that's a side note. So, yes? Uh, you don't have to go down this if you don't want to, but I've also been around, I mean, as part of people who taught me how to read the Bible. Uh, formally would look at that and say that um, that as a result of this experience with Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus in Luke 24, and what Jesus teaches them there, now they have a totally new way of reading the Old Testament in such that they see him everywhere. And, and now this way of reading it lead, lets you look at any place in the Old Testament and see Jesus almost anywhere you want. Yeah, yeah, as, 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 as long as long as you have, as long as you have a bigger a, a bigger picture of Jesus, yeah. If 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 if, if you're looking for the for the resurrection or the, or his death in every verse, you're not gonna find it. Yeah, but, but what it allows them to do, uh, it allows them. Again, this might be not where you want to go, but but it allows them to look at any passage in the Old Testament and say Jesus is here. You can't preach, teach, understand this passage until you find Jesus in, in the paragraph. Mm -hmm. And such that if you do, if, if, you, if you are able to read this thing without Jesus being in it, then you're just, you're just reading it like a Jew, not a Christian. Yeah, I, I don't have a disagreement with that as, as long as you have a big enough Jesus and a, and a big enough s subject matter t to allow the text to speak for itself. So I... I, I I've, you and I have seen abuses of that, of course, where, where, where they're finding his atonement under every little nook and cranny, and that's not the point. It's not just the atonement that's in, that's in the Old Testament. It's Jesus as a child is in the Old Testament, because how are children supposed to live? You know, it, 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 it's, bigger than, it's bigger than just the, his, his, his passion that's in the Old Testament. And, and so I, I don't necessarily have a problem with, with, that, with that conclusion as long as they have a big enough picture of what's being discussed. When they narrow it down too much, that's where you start to get into allegory. And, and be, they begin distorting the text to find Jesus. That's a problem. Yeah. But uh, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have a necessary problem with the, with, the, with the big idea behind that. Did you have your hand up, Shanice? I thought you did. Okay, so... Let's get back to what, what, I, what I, I came to Luke 24 for. So, these things to which Jesus was referring in verse 48, of which they were specifically to be witnesses, were his fulfilling of the biblical claims regarding the Messiah, the Messiah's rejection, and the Messiah's resurrection. When would this ministry of them being witnesses and his messianic claims begin? When when do they begin to serve as witnesses? At, at what time? Where do you see that in this text? You see it though, don't you? Verse what? Verse 49, the very next verse. He says, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my father 
upon you, but you are to stay in, in, in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So here we learn that these group of men are specifically designated by Jesus as witnesses. Their task is going to be to, to uh, take all that's spoken of Christ in the Old Testament that's fulfilled in his actions in life and make the biblical connection. In doing that, they serve as witnesses of these things. That sounds to me like a very unique position. They're not just Bible teachers, right? What are they? Witnesses of what? Jesus' life. They saw it. They saw it. Now we're beginning to narrow down a little bit, aren't we? If, if you didn't witness it, if you didn't see it, how can you be a witness? We're just trying to define and understand what the Bible means when it refers to the idea of an apostle. Yes, go ahead. So by, by framing it like this, you're not only saying there's a, a tighter definition of apostle, I think it's typically thrown around today, but there's also a, t- uh, a tighter definition of witness that is often used today because we Good have point. no problem saying, you know, I'm a witness of, of Christ's salvation in different ways, throwing... I, and I shouldn't just say throwing, but well, because that's probably a good word. We use the verb witnessing. I'm right. witnessing. Right. And it's probably a good word, but there is a general sense and then a specific sense. And now you're pulling out. Good you're, point. You're, you're putting a specific sense yes, I am. on that word witness. Yeah, that, 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 what I'm saying is, if we're comfortable, well, whether we're comfortable with it or not, that's what I'm saying. Witness is a technical term for an apostle. Because they had a particular task that required them to have been witnesses, to have seen the life of Christ, and to be able to make the connections between what's in the Old Testament and what they saw. All right. That's a technical, de- that's a technical, de- yeah, so I'm saying witness is a technical designation. That's a side, that's a side comment. That wasn't the main point, but you're, you're accurate to say that that's what that must mean. I could see somebody who is an apostle today using a loose form of that word would say, I'm also a witness today. And, and Not in this sense. But neither words are being used in the sense that we're talking about in scripture wow. here. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Neither, neither word, yes. I was just going to say, if, so based on all of that, I mean, they only could find two people who could even take Judas. Place. Yeah, you, 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 you get a little ahead of me, but yeah, yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> you, you're right, though. I mean, you, that's the next step, right? The, the next step is if we dropped to 11, how do we get back to 12? Well, we know what happened in the book of Acts. We're going we're gonna to start there next time because the word witness is the key. It's only used one time in, in the gospel. It's used all over Acts. So it starts here in Luke 24, but... How did that get there? So it, it starts here in Luke 24, but that's not where it stays because then it, then it becomes a common designation from that point on. I had two hands. Jana, had your hand up for first, and then I'll come to, to, to Azure. I was going to ask you, so because they, they, they were Jews, they bore witness to the life of Christ, and they were sent to Jews, so it's like everything about them was so special because they were sent to the house of Israel. Um, I just never really made all those different connections to the apostles before. Mm -hmm. And and it really helps us to begin to understand the uniqueness of the apostle Paul who calls himself an apostle to the Gentiles. That's a very... He had a very unique position. Now, it's not, it's not that, the, that the other apostles didn't, didn't minister to the, to the Gentiles. Clearly, they, I mean, Peter is the first one. I mean, Peter's point in Acts 15 is, I opened up the gospel to the Gentiles. But his ministry out of, out of the Gentiles wasn't in the same capacity as the apostle Paul's was. And Paul, of course, gloried in his office in, in uh, Romans chapter 15. 
cross thing? I was just going to ask, um, how does, like, based on what you're saying now, how does that apply to Paul? Like, he didn't, he wasn't a witness to Jesus' like. So, so Paul, Paul is unusual, isn't he? Because unlike these 11 men, soon to be 12 again, he didn't observe the life of Christ. So does Paul open up the gateway for other people to refer to themselves as apostles? I'm going to get to that, so I'm not, I'm not going to tell you right now. But that's, 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 that's next time. We, 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 we have to see exactly how this word is used and what does Paul's apostleship, does that throw a wrench in it? Or is it consistent with what we see here? Well, I'm going to get to that. Oh, yeah. We're, we're, we're. Yeah, I don't have any doubt he was, he was an apostle, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you how people misuse Paul's example to justify themselves being apostles and why that's incorrect. We're going to deal with that. Yeah. And also for people use him as if he's a lesser apostle. Yeah, and absolutely. Therefore, what he says doesn't have as much weight. Weight, yeah. yeah. So well, we're going to deal with that too. Yeah. Because I want to be over. Because I, I want to be over everybody else. I, I want to be over everybody else. If you, okay, good. So, uh, how, how can I, how can, let, let me, let me just make my conclusion before Pam gets to her point. So, throughout the Gospels, Jesus makes one statement after another, which pinpoints the special nature of the men designated as apostles. A special nature that no modern person can fulfill. Not surprisingly, the special nature of these men is continued in the book of Acts, which we'll begin next time. Let's find a word of prayer as we close. Heavenly Father, we're going to give you thanks this evening for our study. Thank you for helping to clarify a little bit, at least, who an apostle really is. I pray that as we continue to seek an understanding that you would give us a clarity that will enable us to, to better affirm what, what we believe, contradict error, and stand on the truth. Accomplish this in this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.